Amen. You can turn your Bible to Luke chapter 13, and I invite you to stand for the reading of God's Word. As you're turning there, let me give you a little foretaste. Next week, we're going to be starting a new sermon series called Stand Firm, Embodying the Unifying Message of Ephesians. As we head into 2024, a year we anticipate will be filled with challenges and divisions out in the world. Uh, we want to be a church that looks different. We want to be a people that reflect the unity that the gospel accomplishes across every dividing line. So we're going to be starting that. Uh, next Sunday, we'll have um, some of those scripture books, those journals that some of you have been using as we've been going through books of the Bible. We'll have those available next week for for purchase, so uh, you can be looking forward to and praying for that, that God will use that series in each of our lives in this coming season. Uh, today, as uh, you've already been introduced to Pastor Lucas Tanner, he's gonna be bringing the word to us. I'm, I'm so excited to have Lucas with us. He preaches the good news of Jesus Christ. Some of you were here 2019 when he preached with us last, and uh, I still resonate with the words he brought to us that day and look forward to him bringing the word to us. If you've got students, by the way, at FGCU, make sure to connect with Lucas, get connected uh, to him. Um, it's a tremendous work God is doing there through that ministry. Let's turn our attention to God's word. Luke chapter 13, starting in verse 10. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had a disabling spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, woman, you are freed from your disability. And he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and she glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the people, there are six days in which work ought to be done. Come on one of those days and be healed not on the Sabbath day. Then the Lord answered him, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water it? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? As he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame. And all the people rejoiced at all the glorious things that were done by him. This is God's word. Let's pray. We rejoice today over the good works that you're still doing, Lord Jesus. And we pray for each one of us who are cognizant of the disablements that we experience in our life. We pray that even today you might reach out, touch us, bring your healing what each one of us needs this day. May we receive it by faith. We pray it in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning. Merry Christmas to you and Happy New Year. Uh, tomorrow is the first day of 2024, and as I come together this morning with you, I was kind of wondering, by a show of hands, how many of you have made at least one New Year's resolution for 2024? Show of hands. Hold your hands up. Okay, not that many. Well, uh, about 40% of Americans make New Year's resolutions every year. Most of those people are young adults between the ages of 18 and 34 years old. In fact, young adults are three times more likely to make New Year's resolutions than people over the age of 55, like some of you, a few of you. 
Every year, millions of Americans commit themselves to better their lives through things like physical health and financial security and career development. But did you know that on average, 80% of those resolutions fail by the second week of February? And maybe that's why some of you aren't making them anymore. (laughs) Statistics say that almost all of us have failed to keep at least one of our resolutions. In fact, a quarter of people have failed to keep a single resolution that they have ever made in their entire lives. Not one resolution, ever. Well, maybe you are one of those unsuccessful people. And there's a pretty good chance, statistically, that you are. Maybe you have committed yourself to the same kind of change year after year for as long as you can remember and you just can't seem to straighten up. Maybe you have given up all hope of ever straightening up. Well, today, in this this reading, we are introduced to a woman who for 18 long years couldn't straighten up, literally couldn't straighten up. And even though this is a true story of a real woman who actually lived in history, she is a living picture of every single one of us. And as we study this passage this morning, I want to talk about the disorientation of sin, how sin disorients us, how Jesus Christ delivers us, and how he gives us a destiny. So three things, the disorientation of sin, the deliverance of Jesus, and the destiny of every believer. Disorientation, deliverance, and destiny. First, I want to talk about the disorientation of sin. This story that Pastor Trent read for us this morning takes place on the Sabbath day. Jesus was uh, teaching in one of the synagogues, as was his custom, in whatever town or village that Jesus was traveling through. If it was the Sabbath day, Jesus would be in the synagogue, and he would often participate in the service. For example, he might stand up and read a passage out of the Hebrew Bible, and perhaps you're familiar with one of those stories. But on this particular Sabbath day, in this particular location, Jesus was teaching. And there was a woman there. And it says in verse 11 that this woman was bent over. And it literally means that she was bent together. Like a Christmas card. I'm sure you got a Christmas card this month. Like a card that's folded over on itself. This woman was folded over on herself. She was doubled over and she could not fully straighten herself out. And Luke, the gospel writer who was also a physician, he, he records this story and he doesn't give us a, a medical explanation for her condition like we might expect for a, a medical doctor to do, but he doesn't do that. We're not told if this was some kind of spinal deformity or if this was a muscular issue. We have no medical explanation given here. It doesn't mean there there isn't one or there wasn't one. It just means that it's not important for us to know. What we need to know is is that there was a spiritual dynamic to this physical malady. Luke tells us that Satan had crippled this woman. Now, listen, this doesn't mean that every time someone gets sick or every time someone is dealing with a disability that there's a spiritual reason for it. That'd be, that would be a misapplication of this passage. It just means that on this particular occasion, this particular woman was suffering from demonic oppression. Satan had disoriented her. So instead of living an upright life, oriented toward God and other people, she was disoriented, literally bent in on herself. And and there was nothing that she could do about it. 
There wasn't a medicine that she could take. There wasn't a therapist that she could see. There wasn't a program that she could do that would alleviate her condition. She was trapped. She was stuck. And there was no way out. In verse 16, Jesus says that she is in bonds. Bonds like like a prisoner would be in bonds or a slave. She was not a free woman. Now, as a society, we've talked a lot about freedom over the past few years. But I wonder how many people actually know what it means to be free. I work at the, at, on a university campus with college students, and if I walked up to a random college student and asked them what it meant to be free, that student, there's a good chance that that student might tell you that freedom is the ability to do what you want to do. To think what you want to think, to say what you want to say, to do what you want to do without hindrance or restraint. But I tell students all the time, that's not freedom. Because you only do the things that you want to do. And so you are a slave to your own impulses and desires. You see, freedom is not the ability to do what you want to do. Freedom is the ability to do what you ought to do. A few years ago, uh, one of my New Year's resolutions was to get in shape. And as you can see, it didn't last. But for about a year, I, I lasted past the second week of February. For about a year, I would get up really early in the morning to run. Now, I'm not a runner, and I'm not a morning person. But I had to get up really early in order to beat the sun, and that was for two reasons. I didn't want it to get too hot outside. Also, I didn't want my neighbors to see me run. It felt embarrassing. It had to look embarrassing. But every morning I would do this. Every morning was a struggle. My alarm would go off at 5 a.m. I'd hit the snooze button. And then it would go off nine minutes later. And I would think, I would lay there and think, I can't do this. I feel like I got hit by a truck. And I would tell myself, okay, just, just sit up in bed. And just put your feet on the floor. You know, because the experts tell you, if you just put your feet on the floor, then you'll get out of bed. It'll be a lot easier. It's not true, by the way. (laughs) But I would do it. I'd I'd sit up, upright in bed. I'd put my feet on the floor. I didn't feel any better. So I'd say, okay, just walk into the bathroom and get dressed. So I'd, I'd walk into the bathroom. I'd get dressed. I'd get ready. And I thought... I've done all this, and I could still get right back in bed and fall asleep in a second. And then, so I'd tell myself, well, just go outside. Just go outside and just start to walk down the sidewalk in the neighborhood. And so I'd do it. I'd I'd force myself to go outside and just put one foot in front of the other down the sidewalk. And after about 10 minutes into that walk, I would finally, after all that time, I'd finally have the energy to break into a jog. Now you would think that that would be the story of the beginning, right? That after a few months that it would get easier. But for me, over the course of a year, it never got easier. Day after day, week after week, month after month, every single morning was a struggle. And the struggle was with myself. One day I was talking to a friend of mine on the phone and we were talking about this. I had been running for about a year at this point and my friend says, so uh, have you gotten to the point where you like to run now? Because that's what they tell you, you know. At first you hate it, but then you love it. The endorphins, Trent's saying, yeah, I love it, it's great. I said, no, I hate it. My friend said, then why are you doing it? You're 40 years old. You have never in your whole life been a runner. Why would you start now? There are plenty of other ways to exercise and get into 
into shape and stay in shape. You don't have to do something you hate at 40 years old. No one is making you to do it. Why are you doing it? And I said, George, I do it because I hate it. And that was true. I was forcing myself to run because I wanted to be free from only doing the things I felt like doing. I wanted to be able to do things I didn't feel like doing. Because you see, if you only do what you want to do, you're not really free. You're a slave to your own impulses and to your own desires. I want the ability to do what I ought to do even when I don't feel like doing it because that is freedom. Again, freedom is the ability to do what you ought to do, not necessarily to do what you want to do. And freedom in the truest sense is the ability to live an upright life that glorifies God. But here's the thing. None of us are able to do that in our own strength. Not a single one of us. On our own, it is impossible to live an upright life that glorifies God. Like this woman, we have all been afflicted by Satan's influence on the world. We have all been afflicted by the fall. St. Augustine, that great African theologian from the early church said that humanity is turned in on itself. We don't live for God. We live for ourselves. We are disoriented by sin. We don't live lives naturally that are Godward facing. Instead, we live lives that are inward facing. We're turned in on ourselves. And like this woman, we are in bonds. We're held captive by our own impulses and desires. We're slaves to sin. We're not free in that truest sense of the word. And there is nothing that we can do about it ourselves. On our own, we are powerless. Listen to how the Apostle Paul describes this human condition in Romans chapter 7. Paul wrote, I want to do what is right, but I can't do it. I want to do what is good, but I don't do it. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. Paul is describing us, isn't he? Don't you find this at work in your own life and in your own heart? And so in that very same passage, the Apostle Paul asks this question, who will deliver me? Thank God, he said. The answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the same Jesus who delivered this woman from her bondage is able to deliver us from our bondage. And so let's, let's talk about how Jesus delivers us. Take a look at verses 12 and 13. If you have a Bible in your pew or have one on your phone, if you look at verses 12 and 13, it says, when Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, woman, you are freed from your disability. And then he laid his hands on her and immediately... She was made straight, and she glorified God. And there are four verbs in these two verses. I'm going to call them the verbs of deliverance. And here they are. It says he saw her, he called her, he spoke to her, and he touched her. And those are the four verbs of deliverance. Seeing, calling, speaking, touching. The first verb of deliverance is seeing. He saw her. Jesus saw this woman. Now, I'm sure that many people that day saw this woman. Many people over the years saw this woman. But that word, that Jesus saw her, means so much more than just catching a glimpse of her with his eyes. It means that 
Jesus took notice of her uniquely, perhaps when no one else took notice of her. You know, think about this woman. If she was there on the Sabbath day, week after week, at some point you might expect for people to start looking past her. You've done that, haven't you? You've seen the same person again and again and again in the same places. And then at some point, that person, it's like they don't exist. You see through them or past them. You might not even notice that they are there after a while. But not Jesus. Jesus noticed her. He paid attention to her. He gave her his attention. He saw what she was going through. And he understood her. He understood her better than she understood herself. Because Jesus understood what was wrong with her. He understood why she was the way that she was. It was Jesus, after all, in verse 16, who told us that it was Satan who had bound her for 18 years. She probably didn't know that. He not only knew that she was suffering, but he knew the source of her suffering. And he knew how long she had endured it. He knew the truth about this woman when she likely didn't know the truth about herself. And Jesus sees you. Jesus sees you. Do you feel seen? Jesus sees you. He sees the real you. The you that you try so hard to hide, that's the you that he sees. I had the a privilege of doing an RUF wedding yesterday of a couple who graduated from FGCU who met in our campus ministry. And during their premarital counsel, counseling, we talked about different levels of vulnerability. We talked about how the, the thing that keeps us from being vulnerable with other people, even our closest friends, is that we, we are all afraid that if people really knew us, that they wouldn't like us anymore, that they'd reject us. It's one of our core fears. And so, because of that, we hardly ever let people see the real us. But that's the you that Jesus sees. He sees right through the facade, and he sees the real you. He understands you, better than you understand yourself. He understands why you are the way that you are. You know, we as a society spend a lot of money to mental health professionals to understand the answer to that question. Why am I the way that I am? Jesus knows. He gets it. He gets you. He knew what this woman went through for 18 years of of her life. And Jesus knows what you went through the first 18 years of your life. You know, those formative years of childhood and adolescence. Jesus knows what it was like to grow up in your home. With your family. In your unique circumstances. He knows what it was like for you to go through all the things that you went through. He knows about all the things that contributed to your growth and development for you to become who you are today. He knows why you interact with people the way that you do. He knows why you respond to authority the way that you do. He knows why you handle conflict the way that you do. He knows you better than you know yourself. He sees you. The second verb of deliverance is calling. He called her. And I want you to notice two things. I want you to notice what he called her, and I want you to notice how he called her. He didn't call her crippled, He didn't call her hunchback. He called her woman. And to us, I know that may sound cold and impersonal, but the word woman is actually a word of endearment and respect. 
Jesus saw her, and when he called her, he didn't identify her by her brokenness or by her shame. Jesus dignified her. Jesus lifted her up with his words. In verse 16, he referred to her as a daughter of Abraham. And now think about how significant that was. He identified this woman as a child of the covenant. He didn't identify her by her proclivities, but by God's promises. And for those of you who are in Christ, Jesus calls you and identifies you not by your sin, not by your shame, but by his promises. Jesus doesn't call us the things that other people have called us. He doesn't call you what your dad used to call you. He doesn't even call us by the things we call ourselves. Think about the things that you have called yourself. We're often our harshest critics. Imagine if you said about other people the things that you say about yourself. If you did that, you might lose your job. You might get punched in the face. But Jesus doesn't call you those things. The voice in your head is not the voice of Jesus. He does not identify you by your shame. He identifies you by his promise. That's good news. And then he spoke to her, and this is the third verb of deliverance. He spoke, he said, woman, you are freed from your disability. Now I want you to notice that Jesus said something about her that at that very moment when he said it, she was not experiencing it. When Jesus said, you are free from your disability, she was, as those words left his lips, at that particular moment, she was still bent over. It wasn't until he touched her that she began to stand. And so for a few seconds, or maybe even a few minutes, we don't know, Jesus had declared something about her that was objectively true, and yet in that particular moment, she was not experiencing it. It didn't feel true. You see that? So Jesus said she was free, But when he said that, she didn't feel free. What he said was objectively true, regardless of her subjective experience. Because if Jesus said she was free, well, then she was free indeed, regardless of how she felt. And Jesus speaks to you, to those who are in Christ by faith, and he says, you are free. You are free from the sin that cripples you and enslaves you. And that is good for us to be reminded of that this morning because maybe you are here today and you don't feel free. Well, just because you don't feel free, brothers and sisters, doesn't mean you aren't free. How does Jesus free us? Well, Jesus frees us By taking upon himself the sin that cripples and enslaves us. The same word that's translated here as disability is also found in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 17. When Matthew quotes the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 53, and Matthew writes that Jesus took our disabilities. You see, on the cross, Jesus Christ took upon himself the sin that cripples us, the sin that enslaves us. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says that God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And Jesus, the one who bore our sin, who bore our shame upon the cross, he pronounces us free 
That is, he pronounces us forgiven of sin's penalty. It's what theologians refer to as justification. It's an act of God's grace where he forgives all of our sins and he accepts us as righteous in his sight because the righteousness of Jesus Christ has been imputed to us and we have received it by faith alone. So for those who have put their faith in Jesus, if that's you this morning, if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, Jesus says that you are forgiven regardless of how you feel. It is objectively true. And finally, the fourth verb of deliverance is touch. It says Jesus touched her. Now at this moment, Jesus reached out his hands and put them on this woman's body and she began to stand. And when Jesus touches her life, she begins to resemble him. You see, when she, before she encounters Jesus, she's bent over. But when Jesus touches her life, she begins to stand upright like Jesus is standing. And she glorifies God. And that is exactly what Jesus is doing to all those he has forgiven and declared righteous in his sight. Jesus is helping you to stand upright in the presence of God. And that's called sanctification. That too is a work of God's grace. We were renewed in the whole person after the image of God and we are enabled more and more to die to sin and live under righteousness. In other words, sanctification is the Holy Spirit changing us over time to be more and more like Jesus. Justification takes place in a moment. Sanctification takes place over a lifetime. In justification, God declares us free from sin's penalty, and in sanctification, he makes us free from sin's power. And those two things don't happen simultaneously. Look at this woman. It wasn't until Jesus touched her that she began to stand upright. But if the Son has set you free, You will be free indeed. Romans 8.30 says that those whom God justifies, he glorifies. uh, Sanctification is just glorification in seed form. They differ only in degree, Thomas Watson said. Those who God justifies, he sanctifies. In other words, if God has declared you righteous, brothers and sisters, he will one day make you righteous. But you won't get all the way there before you die. And that's why I want to end by talking about the destiny of every believer. We, aren't, we won't fully be set free from sin's power until we enter our heavenly rest, which is exactly why this miracle takes place on the Sabbath day, the day of rest. When all ordinary work cease. In fact, that's what the word means in Hebrew, the Sabbath. It means to cease or desist. On the Sabbath, Jesus, uh, God gave his people an opportunity to serve him. It was a creation ordinance and it was a preview of our heavenly rest. When we will cease from all earthly toil and be able to fully enjoy God forever. And that's why Jesus healed on the Sabbath. You saw that the synagogue leader got all bent out of shape because Jesus healed on the Sabbath. But Jesus says, there's not a more appropriate day to heal somebody than the Sabbath. Because the Sabbath is a preview of heaven when all will be healed. When all of us will be healed from our disabilities, both physical and spiritual. You see, when you... Enter your heavenly rest, you will finally stand upright like Jesus in the presence of God, glorifying him free from sin's crippling influence on your life. The Bible says that when you see Jesus, you will be made like him. But until then, you will struggle. And I know you are struggling. 
but don't let that struggle discourage you today. Let me illustrate it this way. Another show of hands. How many of you, when you were a little kid, took at least one piano lesson? Raise your hand. That's almost the entire room. Now, how many of you who raised your hands stuck with it all these years and still play the piano today? Raise your hand. Only a few of you. Well, for those of you, the vast majority of you, who don't play anymore, I want you to imagine that time in your life when you quit playing piano. Go back to that period of your life in your mind. Now, I want you to imagine you're at that stage of your life and you are visited by one of Charles Dickens' Christmas ghosts. And that ghost visits you in the middle of the night and he takes you away to Carnegie Hall. And there you are in Carnegie Hall. You're sitting up in the balcony. Carnegie Hall is filled with people. There's not an empty seat in, in the whole place. And it's dark and there is a single spotlight shining down at, on center stage upon a piano. And after moments of tense anticipation, out walks a musician, finely dressed, and that musician sits down at the piano and plays the most wonderful, the most complex, the most beautiful piece of music that you have ever heard in your life. It was an absolute masterpiece. And when it was over, the entire place erupted into applause. People rose to their feet for a standing ovation that seemed to go on forever. And you leaned over and whispered into the ear of the Christmas ghost, who is that? And the ghost of Christmas future said, that's you in 30 years. And then you opened your eyes and you woke up in your own bed and you heard your mom say, sweetheart, it's time for your piano lesson. <laughs> now wouldn't you on that very day Resolve to keep practicing no matter how discouraged you were the day before. I know it wouldn't make the struggle any easier. You'd still have to practice every single day. None of that would change. But you would practice with a renewed sense of enthusiasm and determination. Why? Because you knew what you were destined for. I want to give you a vision for what you were destined for. One day, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, you will stand upright like Jesus. One day you will be free from sin's crippling influence on your life. That is the destiny of every believer. So how do we become in practice what God has destined us to be? After all, we're not talking about being transformed into a distinguished musician. We're talking about being transformed into the likeness of God. How do we do that? Well, Charles Spurgeon, the great Baptist preacher, said, the way to be transformed into the likeness of God is to live in the company of God. And that's what this woman was doing. Luke tells us that this woman was one of a number of people coming to the synagogue on the Sabbath day in order to be healed. That's why she was there all along. She came into the presence of God week after week to be healed by God. Now, I wonder if we think about what we're doing here this morning with that much intentionality. When you woke up this morning and you had your coffee and got dressed and got in the car and came here, did you think that you were coming to a healing service? But when we come into God's presence week after week, we ought to come with the same intention that this woman came with. We ought to come into the presence of God, hoping and praying that God, by his grace, will heal us today. The Westminster Confession of Faith says that the saints grow in grace through the continual supply of strength from the sanctifying spirit 
of Christ. In the Upper Room Discourse, Jesus said, If my words abide in you, you will bear much fruit. There is a continual supply of strength in the words of Jesus. Do you feel weak? Do you feel spiritually weak this morning, like me? Do you feel spiritually sick today? There is a continual supply of strength in the words of Jesus. When we read the word and hear it preached, when we memorize the word and meditate upon it day and night, when we pray God's words back to him, when we sing his words to one another, when we eat his words in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, there is a continual supply of strength in the words of Jesus. Every time we receive the words of Jesus by faith, we draw up a continual supply of strength. Do you want to be transformed into the likeness of God? Then put yourself in the company of God on a regular basis and by faith draw upon that continual supply of strength from the sanctifying spirit of Christ in his word. And as you do that, God will enable you more And more, little by little, to live an upright life that glorifies God. For you who belong to Jesus Christ by faith, God has declared you free from sin's penalty. And beloved, he will one day make you free from its power. No matter how you feel today, no matter how many times you failed, if the Son has set you free, you shall be free indeed. Amen? Let's pray. Oh Lord, we are bruised and broken. We are weary from the fall. Lord, we are turned in upon ourselves. We live lives that are self-focused and not Godward facing and outward facing. And Lord, we need to hear your words. We need your words to lift us up, to speak good news, to revive us, to heal us, to change us, to empower us, to give us a vision for our destiny that impacts the way that we interact with our current circumstances and our struggles. Give us that word today and help our hearts by your spirit receive it with faith and eagerness and desperation and joy. To you be the glory forever and ever. Amen.